Now to North America, to Arizona, and a land battle which could put Red Indians back on the warpath. Forbidding, inhospitable, this is Indian country. Hardly worth fighting for, perhaps. Yet here, a century ago, Red Indians did battle with the cavalry. And soon, something similar might happen again. In fact, the Indians of today are all too ready to take on the Great White Father in Washington, or at least his minions in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. For Wild West comparisons apart, the plight of Indians like these is no laughing matter. Since they were driven from their land by the white pioneers, they've been an embarrassing minority, a thorn in the flesh to the US government, who've administered aid and welfare without really bettering the lot of the unfortunate Indian tribes. These Indians, now collecting routine food handouts from the government, are Navajos, 140,000 strong and the largest of the surviving tribes. They're all poor and most can neither read nor write. By American standards, their lives are both primitive and backward. But they have their pride and they remember their past as a fierce warrior nation. True, they were beaten by the white man once, but that only makes them more determined not to let it happen again. Now, 3,500 of them, scattered over 100,000 acres of scrubland, have been told they'll have to move to quit their homelands and their sheep flocks in the biggest forced relocation since the one which followed those bitter Indian wars glorified on the big screen. The present upset over land dates back almost to the time when the Indians of the region were last forced to move. Then, in 1864, it was cowboy Kit Carson whose burnt earth policy cruelly forced them on their legendary long walk. Now it's like a nightmare return. The Indians have to pull up stakes again, once more at the bidding of the white men. <laughs> For almost a hundred years, part of the land on which the Navajos raise their sheep and ponies has been promised to the Hopis, a tiny tribe of 6,000 people. Over the years, the governments let their promise to the Hopis lapse. Now they're trying to put things right. But that's causing more trouble than could have been thought possible in 1882, when President Arthur originally set his seal on the pledge. A federal judge in Tucson has ruled that a 1974 Act of Congress must be carried out, and that means moving many communities, both Navajo and Hopi, whether they like it or not. Displaced families have been offered $27,000 to buy a new home and several thousand dollars more in removal expenses. And for those Indians who aren't tied to their traditional way of life, it's a golden opportunity. But many Indians don't envy the white man's civilization. Through an interpreter, the opinion of Pauline Whitesinger. I told them, I said, um, these uneducated uh, uh, women or ladies, you never know what's gonna, uh, what you're going to do, I said, since they don't understand what you're doing and what the plan is, I said. Uh, whenever you show up over there, they're going to they're going to be angry, I said. They might libel, shoot, or whatever. They, uh, any weapon they have, they're going to show it up to you, whip you, or whatever. It's going to happen to you, I said. It Does the lady have a gun? Yes. Can you see it? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> when Indian affairs men tried to move Pauline's fence, she beat them, small as she is, and threw them off single-handed. They haven't been back, but apparently they reported the incident. For now, the bureaucrats are genuinely worried about violent opposition from Indians like Jim Redsteer. I felt the same way. And I serve the military, the United States Armed Forces, protecting the whole United States. 
and, and I thought, thought this, this was part of the land, land I protected during my time in armed, armed forces. forces. Are you, Are you prepared, prepared to use violence, violence yourself? yourself? I, I use anything. I use stick, guns, what have you, mines, anything. I just want to. I just don't want to uh, leave, leave my land. land. I have been, been moved once, once before that time I was just a child, and I, we, were we were forced to, to, uh, to move to another location. location. Well, I don't know why, why the, the government, government is doing this to us, and this is just where's the where's the, the, where the people? people? I don't know. It seems like the government, the United States government, is uh, the BIA's. All on the Hopi side. No, no, they, they have been for all the time I could remember. Thank you, babe. On the other side of the squabble are the Hopi Indians, whose tiny settlements cling to rocky escarpments surrounded for eight centuries by the land of the Navajo. They're traditionally the underdogs, a reputation which they've used to their advantage in recent years to gain support in Congress. When they last lobbied politicians, the Hopis claimed that the land dispute with the Navajos was bitter enough to cause a range war. There's little doubt that it was these rumors which convinced the government to redraw the map in favor of the Hopis. At present, the tribal boundaries look like this. The Navajo Reservation sprawls across 25,000 square miles. The Hopis live on a small reservation in the middle of a rectangle they say should all belong to them. The dispute is over the unshaded area in the rectangle. That's long been shared by both tribes. In future, it will belong only to the Hopis, and the Navajos who live there will have to move. Poor though the land is, it is farmed by the Hopis, who have one of the oldest histories of all the Indian tribes. Like the Navajos, the Hopis have managed to preserve their language and their traditions, but there the similarity ends. Where the Navajos were once raiders and are now herders, the Hopis are generally farmers. The division has run deeper than that, but even to this day, there's little love lost between the neighboring tribes. Indeed, if anything goes missing in a Hopi camp, it's automatically blamed on the nearest Navajo community. That typical Hopi attitude from the Navasi family. We had horses here and they used to graze, like, you know, out in the area here. And one day we let them go and we couldn't find the horses, so my father went out uh, with another horse looking and on foot looking for these horses. When he brought that back, when he found them, the manes were cut, the tails were cut, they'd been drugged through the mud, these kinds of incidents. And this was the Navajo Indians? Uh, we, we can't, we can't, well... We, we couldn't, couldn't say, say we couldn't say who did this, but, but we just presumed that you know this is was from the Navajos because these are the only people that gave us trouble, the, uh, and, and they do graze around here. And it's not that easy to you know leave this area. We've been lived down, we we've been born down here, raised down here, did all the work down here, and and uh, hate we hate to leave the area, but. Uh, what kind of a situation that we are in now? See, this is petition to the Navajos. And uh, the, they explained to us when it was petition how we would be to leave here, if we want to leave here, see? We would. At Window Rock, the capital of the Navajo Territory and headquarters of the tribal council that administers the reservation, Officials believe the United States government is unaware of the strength of feeling among the tribespeople. They don't think Washington understands the Indian people or realizes how much land means to them. We met the executive director of the tribe, Samuel Pete, and asked for his view on the government's handling of the situation. Well, they thought that uh, the uh, great white father in uh, Washington could just come in and uh, put the two little Indians uh, uh, together and uh, solve their problem. And I think we there was a capability on both sides that um, we could have uh, resolved this problem. 
uh, more humanely uh, than what the federal government has done. Now, there's a lot of talk that uh, if the federal agents do move in to try and get these people off the land, that there'll be violence. Uh, how concerned are you that this could happen? We could have a, a war here. Well, we're dealing with uh, traditional illiterate Navajos uh, who just don't understand uh, laws that are being made by the federal government. Uh, we try very hard to explain even our tribal ordinances, our tribal laws, and they have a, a very difficult time in uh, comprehending uh, these ordinances. Uh, and so to have a uh, law made uh, in Washington and then uh, imposed on them, uh, this is no solution. You know, it just comes out of the thin air and it, they have to do certain things. And in this case, to move from their uh, traditional homelands. And so how concerned are you then that uh, the situation could lead to violence? Okay, I'm very concerned about, um, uh, about the, the violence. We have forewarned the uh, bureaucrats, we have forewarned the senators and the congressmen that there is going to uh, that, that their solution is going to lead to violence, and I think that is where we're uh, uh, heading. And it might make good headlines this talk of Indians putting on their war paint and sharpening their arrows, but it's not that far from the truth. Land here is an emotive issue, and the people are simple folk for whom actions speak louder than words. They are ready to use gun law and shoot on sight when all they hold dear is threatened. The Hopis and the Navajos are angry with each other and both are angry with the government. So whatever measures are taken, an Indian uprising really could be just over the horizon.